Well, there's a slight change or deviation from the schedule. The schedule says, uh, what is an aura part four? So we actually did in three days what was scheduled for four days, but should probably have been done in five days. Uh, it's called greed. So our talk today is, uh, do only the fit survive or kingdoms and co-evolution? It'll be a little bit thinner, and it'll be a little bit lighter uh, than we've been for the last several days. We've been looking through Rosicrucian cosmography. We're trying to get a very simple exploration of very elementary Rosicrucian philosophy, as elementary as we can get. We've been trying to be experiential. That is, we're trying to uh, relate to the Rosicrucian uh, concepts, ideas, statements of truth by being able to experience them and uh, test them for ourselves. It seems to me that the uh, Rosicrucian philosophy has been pretty accurate in describing the human condition what we are as beings of form, but also living beings, but living beings that not only grow and act, but have motivation and feeling to do both. And yesterday we saw that uh, the description of the human condition being that we are thinking beings so that we have a reason and a rationale behind our motivation. And we also noted yesterday that ultimately we are spiritual beings. We have intuitions, pure truths that help us to determine whether our thoughts and ideas are true. And intuitions even telling us how to test out our thoughts, or any experience that we have in the phenomenal worlds. So it seems to me that the Rosicrucian philosophy does a wonderful job of describing what the universe is and our part in it, even though we're doing a very cursory, a very uh, broad, vague view of it. In fact, uh, I've looked through a lot of different things and as far as in a very simple, direct, practical way, Rosicrucian philosophy is very, very clear about describing the world that at least I live in and what my life is like. It's unfortunate that we're not going to be able to look into how this wondrous teaching about all, with all of the principles of the desire world, which we saw were so practical, you know, we left out a huge part when we discovered, when we discussed the desire world. We just discussed the mechanics, only the mechanics. That is how things are attracted and repulsed by interest and indifference. But we didn't go, we only looked at the forms, basically, because within and behind all of those desires, even all of the principles of all of the worlds are stories. This, that is the essence of story, like we find in myth, or as we find in uh, scripture. Those stories are actually within and behind every desire. That would be a whole big study that I've been working on for six years now, trying to understand how uh, myth and spiritual philosophy are pointing to the same reality and trying to understand myth better, and trying to understand the Rosicrucian philosophy better. I had a wonderful time with it, but, you know, like, our lies are not just a bunch of emotions. They have a story behind them. And within everything that we experience, that is the case. All right. Uh, we haven't looked into the wonder of how the Rosicrucian philosophy is worked out such that the principles of all of the worlds are the source of all of the spiritual exercises. That's a whole series of talks that someday I would like to come and offer 
is what kinds of spiritual exercises in a healthy way help us to unfold according to the principles of nature as they are found right within our being. How everything that makes the whole cosmology, the whole evolution of which we are participants, how that is all worked right into the very exercises that the Rosicrucian philosophy gives us to unfold and become in a spiritual way. That'll have to wait for another time, as will a lot of the um, details. You know, we're only looking at, uh, in our exploration, we're only looking in rough, and maybe sometime uh, we should do something and just take a detailed study of, of something like that. So the Rosicrucian philosophy in its statement is very clear, very accurate. There are parts of it that we see we misunderstand, and there are parts of it that could be clarified, but basically it's a wonderful teaching. In all of our studies so far, we have been using a very rudimentary method of understanding. We've been using the method of contrast or the method of difference. That is to say, the airy signs, for example, Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius have to do with things of the intellect, with things of thought. And what we've been looking at so far is only the things of Gemini. We've been eliminating, we've been contrasting. Uh, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do to say that the form of a human is not like the form of a chair because the form of a human grows. Or it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say that by contrast, the form of the human is different than the form of a plant because the form of the human can move. That's compre that, that is a use of the principle of contrast. But the principle of contrast is not the total way to go about it because polarization is not the only way uh, we come to experience life. It's absolutely necessary. We have to have the polarization of the lungs where we breathe in and breathe out and part of our consciousness is carbonated. Uh, that is with carbon dioxide and part of it is oxygenated and we have that from the principle of polarization. But there's something about the principle of contrast that always has an argument about it. Sometimes the argument is very beautiful such as a Bach fugue or something like that, but it's still an argument. And within that, uh, there is a separative quality and there is a competitive quality. And that competitive quality can sometimes be very destructive. Uh, just, uh, just this morning, I read in the newspaper, this is literally happened yesterday that in Alabama, the man who came in second place in a contest to see who could uh, quote the most from the Bible, the man who came in second murdered the man who came in first. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know, the same thing could happen with the Rosicrucian Cosmo conception. We could quote it until it came out our ears. If we couldn't live it, uh, the same sort of thing could happen. In fact, that principle of competition has become terrible in the world. Uh, we live in what is called right now social Darwinism. In, and the idea of social Darwinism, the principal idea is called natural selection, which in street terms is called survival of the fittest. 
And uh, that is the principal notion of all of materialistic Darwinian evolution. In fact, it has even gotten so bad that uh, it pervades our social lives, it pervades our political lives, and even our economic lives. It's, you know, what is now called let the marketplace determine things a century ago that used to be called laissez-faire government. You know, and it's, it, it, they try to say it's democracy, but it really isn't democracy. I can't hire a, a whole batch of lawyers like AT&T has them in the stable. You know, we can't do that. Uh, it's so bad, the competition, that we're approaching destruction. Everybody wants to have nicer houses with bigger lots. And do you know that we're, we're committing suicide by that? This has happened in history. The Easter Island statues, the archaeologists have uh, just recently uh, found out that the Easter Islands used to have a full environmental sphere, all kinds of plants and animals and everything. But what they did is they denuded the islands to build those big statues because they got into competition over who could big, build the biggest heads. And pretty soon they had totally ruined the islands, the, 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 the habitat, the environment, so that they were unfit for living. We're doing that now, you know, because simple geometry tells us that the area goes as uh, the square of the diameter, and every time we go another quarter of a mile out of every little town and city, that, that quarter of a mile, you have to square it, and there's that much arable land that is taken out of... Uh, taken out of circulation. It's, it's really a, a difficult thing. So we're looking at a principle of evolution. Now let's briefly look at, it's going to be a slightly stilted, it's going to be a slightly biased presentation, but I'll give you the materialistic science uh, view, a loaded view of uh, what they feel evolution is. Blind and dumb matter, due to some astronomical explosion, became distributed throughout space. By random chance and meaningless coincidence, there was at least one place in the entire cosmos, all of the galaxies, galaxies and such, that the elements mixed in such a way that there was a cosmic soup, is what they call, primordial soup is what they call it now, and that in this primordial soup, chemicals interacted so that they could live. Interesting. By accident, uh, some of these compounds uh, developed the ability to remember. Also by accident, this memory became organized right into the compounds so that these compounds could ramify and they could compete in, in an environment and become very elaborate organisms. Eventually, these, uh, another accident occurred and these organisms, by the process of memory, became self-conscious, even though there isn't a self. And this self-consciousness continued so far that it understands everything, even the meaningless and purposeless coincidences and random experiences, so that we can actually turn matter back into energy. Now, if you believe that, I have a whole bunch of bridges that I'll sell you. I'll sell you every bridge between here and Madison, Wisconsin. And... The adherents of this view have nerve to call people like us of mystical persuasion superstitious. That's quite a thing, you know. Now, it's true. There are a lot of sophistications and refinements in, that, in this. You know, I'm sure that if we had uh, Stephen Hawking and if we had uh, Stephen Jay Gould, and a lot of the uh, cosmologists and environmental biologists come in here, 
they would come up with all sorts of elaborate things, but they would still have to say that it was all done by chance and that it was meaningless and purposeless because that's the way they believed. There's, there are prodigious thoughts, and it's really amazing what scientists come out with, and I, I don't mean to belittle them at all because they have a brilliance probably beyond every one of us in this room and probably collectively all of us. But that doesn't mean that uh, they, you know, that they don't miss the truth. Uh, so even though it's a loaded view, uh, it is uh, a fairly representative view of what materialism thinks. But it is also true that there is a lot of superstition surrounding mysticism. Right within our own philosophy, we believe a lot of things and we state as fact a lot of things that we haven't proven to ourselves yet and we haven't lived out. And that's a form of superstition. But all in all, the Rosicrucian philosophy is a better experiment than an experiment that's limited to a test tube or limited to a laboratory. The alchemists, the early Rosicrucian alchemists, called it the great experiment because no matter how much you studied, no matter what you did, until you could live out the experiment and prove to yourself the nature of reality within your own being, you couldn't do anything. So at a certain time in the alchemical development, somebody did what was called hermetic sealing. That is, they had their own vehicle as a retort. And within that retort, sealed off from the rest of the world, they developed and created the universe within themselves in, and interacted with the greater cosmos. And this came to be known as the great experiment. Uh, another paradoxical thing about all of this is, is that even though uh, there is a lot of stupid assumption in the materialistic basis for evolution, there's a lot of truth in it. Even if we leave the things in like dumb matter, because we've said all along that the, material, that the material world, especially the most densely uh, congealed part of the material world, is an interface between the known and the unknown. And in that interface, you might say that as wonderful as this physical creation is, it is an interface between God's creative dream and creative act and the unknown, and it is in one way congealed ignorance, and that by interacting with the unknown or interacting what we're ignorant of, we draw it into ourselves and we spiritualize it. We even have a term for it in the Rosicrucian philosophy. It's called the materialization, the, the spiritualization of matter. Uh, we're going to be talking about that some in a little bit. So it is that the idea that there is dumb matter, and if you one looks only from the outside, uh, one can see how the evolutionary biologists come to the conclusions that they come to. Without the intuitive insight and without understanding the purpose behind it, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. And it really is true. Competition is a major factor in the realization of knowledge. However, it is not the only one. There is also not just contrast, there is comparison. How is this like that? And going along with comparison, again, Venus attracts and unifies, is the principle of cooperation. And here is where the spiritual philosophy really excels in understanding and recognizing evolution. For example, the pine trees out here, they do all right in evolution. They're standalones, though. They can self-pollinate. 
the wind or sometimes even the pollen falling down from two pine trees brushing each other is enough to pollinate them. They have survived. But if we take the composites, all the sunflowers, which includes all of the petal flowers that we have, they didn't, they weren't self-sufficient. They cooperated. They cooperated with the bees. They cooperated with the insects. And as a consequence, they're ramified all over the world in all kinds of different forms, each more beautiful than the last. So it is true that there is something about competitive survival, but an even bigger fact in evolution is cooperation. I'm very indebted to a lot of my thought in this, to one of the deepest Rosicrucian students I have ever met. He's only been on the grounds here, I think, only twice in his life. His name is Alan Dong, and he lives up in Oregon now, and he is a uh, organic farmer up there, and for many years he was a soils chemist uh, for the University of California up in the San Joaquin Valley. He probably knows more about water than most people living. He's one of the uh, most knowledgeable people about water altogether, and he's brilliant. He studies things like mathematical philosophy, like Rudolf Carnap and Bertrand Russell and things like that. And he writes out all these mathematical philosophy answers. And the next thing you know, he's stating all of the Rosicrucian principles and practical applications of them. And it, 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 it just blows you away to see... Uh, Rosicrucian philosophy a la, a, la, a la Rudolf Carnap, you know. He is, <laughs> he's a wonderful, wonderful man. In fact, uh, about two years ago, uh, do any of you read Discover Magazine, which is a pop science magazine? They ran an article in there on Alan Dong because he has his one of his hobbies. He happens to be a Libra, and he does cooperation. He has partners where they make an invention where they take something like a bicycle pump or an automobile jack or a hand mill and they turn it into a device that will help poor people in third world countries to solve problems of feeding themselves and existing uh, at very low prices. And he's known all over the world. He has letters coming in from all over the world. And then what he does, it's not competition, it's cooperation. They'll have an idea. Like they'll take, a, they'll take a jack, an automobile jack, and how can we make a cheap press for pressing oil out of almost anything? And he'll make his version, and he'll give it to his partner, and his partner will improve on it, and then he'll give it back to him, and he'll improve on it. And they go back and forth and back and forth until they're absolutely certain that they can't do anything, and then they patent it. And then they put it in the public domain to protect it so that somebody can't, uh, charge exorbitant prices and make all kinds of money. This is, this is a man that really, really, really serves. And uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, great to be, have met him. Uh, you know, there are some people that uh, to just be walking on the surface of the planet at the same time they are walking is, is a great privilege. And a lot of the uh, co-evolutionary thought that I have has been developed together in conversations with Al Dong. He even left some very rare pear trees here, but they were never taken care of, and they, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't last. Okay. Al Dong, D-O-N-G. He lives right outside of Eugene, Oregon. I forget what the... He's on a farm in a little town about 15 miles east of Eugene. So, if we compete... We stay head to head. But if we cooperate, we create and we diversify. It isn't just a matter of two dogs fighting over one bone. It's a matter of saying that there's a different way we can do this. And if we don't fight evolution, and if we are creative, we can find different ways to accomplish things. And this is the way the Rosicrucian philosophy looks at evolution. We're going to start going into the details of it, but it's almost like a drama. We said all along that in one way, this is a creation for God. And it's a creation that's something like a play, if you want to look at it that way. In this play, yeah, there has to be somebody like an Iago that eggs uh, 
Ah, uh, oh, what's his name? <laughs> Othello. On to violence. But Iago is just somebody like you and I. But Iago has to play his role for keeps. Otherwise, Othello can't play his for keeps or Desdemona can't play hers for keeps. What we are in is a drama where we take on successive roles and we play them for real. And because of that, we realize things. But at the same time, even though there may be something adversarial in our roles with each other, the adversary is cooperating. When various archangels are guiding various species in struggles, life and death struggles, it's for keeps. It is not that the uh, archangels hate each other. It is indeed something to improve the species, not by a blind, random uh, selection, natural process thing, but like passing back and forth the uh, automobile jack to make a better oil press. There is a cooperation, you know, like one gets the advantage for a while, and there's learning, and then there's progress that goes so that the other uh, uh, comes up. So it really is like that. And in all of this, even though we're taking different roles, we collectively, and the one totally, is really enjoying this. If we enjoy life, it makes it all altogether different. It's stated in a sexist way, but Meister Eckhart, the great German mystic, said, God is enjoying himself. And that's really true. You don't have to but look at the sunlight out here on the trees to know that there isn't a great joy going on. And even in a tempest, there is that. So, when we look, we're going right back to the beginning again. When we look at the material world, the mineral kingdom, we find its entire existence in the physical world, nothing more. It's like blind matter. It's like dumb existence. Now, this is a really interesting conception that the uh, Rosicrucian philosophy has here, that the mineral kingdom is a unique and paradoxical interface between the known and the unknown. In one way, it's completely dumb. It is, you know, there's, it, it provides resistance to everything we try to do. No matter if we're a sculptor, if we're a painter, anything we try to do, you know, even when you try to get out of the body in the morning or if you walk about five, ten miles, the body just by its physical nature gives us resistance. Now, here the Rosicrucian philosophy has a wonderful principle. We've spoken about it before. We, it's worthy of repeating again and again each time from a little bit different point of view. It isn't stated as this is the law of this, but it's all over everywhere in the Rosicrucian philosophy, and that is the principle of service. Everything that exists serves. There isn't anything that doesn't serve. And it is a useful and unnecessary service. God doesn't waste. Everything is necessary. It's all used. Now, the beautiful thing is that this uh, resistance that the mineral kingdom has, especially in the solids, that this resistance is its service. That is the service. It gives us something to fight against. If we didn't have that to fight against, we wouldn't have real experiences. Moreover, the service that the mineral kingdom gives us is a form that, because it's resistant, is just not going to puddle away. And so all of the other kingdoms that we see in the visible world need the mineral kingdom. They need the mineral kingdom, the plants, the animals, Humans, we need the mineral kingdom in order to have a body that 
just doesn't vanish. We want to do so. It's a wonderful service. And here's something that is so unconscious that it's like a deep, deep trance is still serving. Now, that, that's a really, really beautiful, uh, I'm in a sort of a energetic mood today, so I, I am I'm in a very appreciative mood. The, uh, there are several paradoxes about this because the macrocosmic physical body of God doesn't have a form except the globular form of the earth because it doesn't have a form, the mineral kingdom, by sacrificing that is or experiences all forms. And it's, it's so unevolved that it doesn't have a form of its own, and for that reason it gets to distinguish itself through all of the other forms. Now, there's also something about this, that at the same time, the mineral kingdom is the most resistant, it is also the most obedient. Of all of the kingdoms that we deal with, it's the most obedient. Water at the same temperature and pressure always boils at the same point. Chemical reactions of the same two reagents in the same amounts, under the same conditions, will always produce the same result. That is, the mineral kingdom is perfectly obedient. Now, the, way, the reason for all of this is, is wow, it's, it's something rather deep. You know, plants have sports, and they have mutations and things like that, but the minerals are all always just right. Now, the Rosicrucian philosophy has a very profound notion about this. Everything in the creation starts out from scratch. Everything starts out as part of the universal spirit. All conscious, but not all self-conscious, not objectively conscious, and not wakingly conscious. So the Rosicrucian philosophy says that the parts of spirit that have not, and there are always an infinite number of them within the pet potential of spirit, I don't even know how to use the word parts, it's not even the wrong word, that of spirit which has not yet been distinguished or come to self-consciousness that it makes a sacrifice of leaving that all consciousness and en masse as a life wave dips into unconsciousness. And when it dips into unconsciousness, it goes through all kinds of different mutations. Many, many mineral states, many different kinds of plant states, many kinds of animal states, until it reaches a human-like state where it again regains the spiritual consciousness, only now it is waking objective consciousness. Now, according to the Rosicrucian seers, that the life wave that is our current minerals is plunged deep into matter. This means several things. This means that the consciousness of the minerals is like a deep unconsciousness, so much so that it is uh, like a trance. In fact, oh, how to say it? We've been talking about the spirit matter pole and the time space pole, and we say they're both two extremes of the same thing. But the universal spirit, located, as we said yesterday, in the region of abstract or ideational thought and beyond, deeper into the spiritual worlds, that spirit is still there, even though 
it is indirectly experiencing at the other end of the pole material existence. And so the experience of the consciousness of the mineral kingdom and the Rosicrucian philosophers who developed the Rosicrucian philosophy developed it by a kind of seership that has the association of consciousness. That is, they could be like inside the consciousness of the mineral while still being themselves and experiencing what the mineral consciousness is like and being able to report that. It's a high degree of seership. Their statement is that since the mineral body is like it doesn't have a vital body. It's like a human that has been driven out of their physical body by a hypnotist. And they're not even in touch with their etheric body because that's been taken over by the hypnotist. And that the, the mineral kingdom then is, has the consciousness of a deep, deep trance. So like it's even deeper than sleep. So like it's, like it's that kind of unconsciousness. So even though the collective spirit that is behind the minerals is much removed in the world of abstract thought, it and the form that it experiences through in the, material, in the mineral kingdom is in a consciousness of deep, deep trance. So in effect, what the Rosicrucian cosmological conception is saying in a straightforward way is things are waking up and that the process of waking up is a slow, hard process. The Rosicrucian philosophy even goes so far as to say that it's good to break up the earth because that it has a waking effect. So that if we took jackhammers and went out on, on I-5 out here and started breaking up and said it was part of our religious exercises and that we were relieving the earth, uh, <laughs> uh, I think I don't. I don't think our First Amendment rights would extend very far. No, we're going along at a nice speed today. We could even be done in an hour's time. My goodness, I didn't know that that was possible. What? Or two? Or two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Because of this, since the consciousness of the mineral kingdom, which is called a group spirit, there isn't even a group spirit differentiated. It's still in the universal spirit with the uh, mineral kingdom. Since it's in the world of spiritual ideas, it therefore represents, you know, there's an idea behind every emotion. And all of the colors that are in the desire world, all of the things that make us emotionally colorful, those things are reflective projections of the idea of color. That in that idea of color, we spoke about that yesterday when we were talking about the germinal, germinal ideas of emotion. Those colors or the full spectrum that represents the whole idea of the creation are reflected in all the minerals. So that the periodic chart is a reflection, all of the atomic states in the periodic chart are a reflection of the whole cosmos itself. That the whole primordial idea that is behind all of evolution is reflected in the different elemental states. We could go into, you know, uh, all of those things, but that's uh, uh, too much. Oh, boy. This fact that the, uh, min the consciousness of the mineral kingdom is located in the universal spirit is provable. It's demonstrable by looking at stellar spectroscopy. The spectroscopy or spectrography, that is, it's universal in that the same minerals are find, found in the spectrum of light coming from each and every star. 
so that the universal idea of the basic light that goes throughout the universe, we can find that in the Fraunhoff lines of the spectrum in the line, in, you know, as we look at the light that comes from each star. Some stars have more boron and some only get as dense as iron. Uh, very few get as dense as our solar system where we have get to the heavy metals and such like that. But basically, uh, the universe, that, that the universal spirit is universal and that its principles work throughout the cosmos is shown by that fact. It's another case again where the Rosicrucian Fellowship is a, uh, is a very, uh, very, very true thing. All right, before uh, passing on to the next stage, uh, I'd like to look at a few, I said I was going to give a few uh, uh, advanced things for people to think about that I'm really interested in but don't have the time to get into. One of those is embryology. Uh, in embryology, in the human embryo, from the conception all the way to birth, all of the evolution of the past is recapitulated. And it's a fact that the biochemistry of that is such that the 12 basic cell salts control each stage. Like when the vitamin A comes in, that whole process of devel developing the eye is controlled by one of the 12 salts. And I think it would be a really great idea if some uh, probationer or some student wanted to take the time and study embryology from the viewpoint of biochemistry and relate it to astrology and look through and see that each stage everywhere along the line, uh, you know, of, of the, the redevelopment of the body and evolution would be a wonderful thing. You see, every time we come back to birth, we have to go all the way back to depending on the mineral kingdom. Because if you deprive the fetus of an adequate amount of each of the different, uh, of one of the different 12 basic cell salts, that fetus will misdevelop. We're absolutely dependent for the fetus to, de to develop to go right back to the mineral kingdom again. And it's just a fascinating thing uh, to, you know, to, to, to look at our evolution in that way. The uh, evolution, while we're on sideline topics, I have one more little one. The evolution of the mineral kingdom in providing form is going to be progressively improved. Like the Rosicrucian philosophy says that before too long, this physical earth is going to dissolve back into the ethers and go through a the remainder of this revolution back into the higher spiritual worlds, and then it's going to come out again. Only the next time that the earth is reborn as uh, an external uh, world like this, it's only going to be as dense as the liquids. This means that we, that this means that, that the mineral kingdom is going to advance from being this resistant but still it's going to have enough integrity and enough resistance so that we can have bodies that are made of liquids. You know, like sort of as like, like fish will be. It will be yeah, yeah. We'll have a, can you imagine what our consciousness is going to be like? We won't have this hard material consciousness anymore where everything is sharp edged. We'll have a much more flowing kind of consciousness because everything we experience in our body is going to be a totally different kind of experience. Uh, it's uh, so <laughs> I love you in all your gush. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Would that be something? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes. Uh, all right. In modern material science, the morphologists or taxonomists or evolutionary biologists have, they determine evolutionary kingdoms in a different way than we do. They do it completely on material form and they do it now completely on material compounds. And they have many kingdoms now. 
and they base the kingdom not on evolutionary experience in consciousness, but they base it on a differentiation that seems to be a significant departure in the DNA RNA uh, uh, structure. Uh, the Rosicrucian Fellowship or the Rosicrucian philosophy teaches that kingdoms are a result of evolutionary experience and uh, it has to do with consciousness. What differentiates the between the mineral kingdom and the vegetable or plant kingdom is life. That is something lives and grows. Everything that is in the vegetable kingdom lives and grows as long as it lives. A plant or a tree never stops growing. This is the way it extends itself in life. Um, this is a result, oh boy, I don't know, I'm deviating a little bit here from my notes, and I'm not staying with them carefully, and I wanted to do that today. Um, all forms in the, or all members of the plant kingdom live directly or indirectly on vital life as it comes from the sun. They all live. Some, I say indirectly, because most things get their uh, energy or their, their etheric flow out of sunlight and grow directly. Some, like uh, fungi and bacteria and viruses, are stealers. They uh, get their life from uh, other living forms that have life. In their physical form that we get are either fungi or bacteria or viruses. And because they live, it's like uh, there are, boy, a better pass. Uh, I don't want to get too far, too far off. Um, viruses are a special case. We can make viruses with chemicals off the shelf, denatured chemicals, and they will live, but they won't grow and they won't reproduce. Uh, that's, these are things that have been done. Uh, this is a speculation, but I do believe that viruses are our first human creations. Everything begins down at the mineral, mineral level, and a virus is a mineral plant in that it is almost as much mineral as it is plant, and everything always begins with the Saturn period. And everything about viruses is Saturnine. That is, they, you know, like if you have a viral, uh, a viral pneumonia versus a bacterial pneumonia, the viral pneumonia will be at a lower temperature because it likes cold better. If you have something like shingles, I've had perpetual shingles now for about uh, five or six years, maybe even longer, that uh, they don't like, they, they like the cold. As soon as I start riding my bicycle and the temperatures are below zero, I can just feel, the, you know, they're thriving on that. And even so far as the most common illnesses that we have, they're colds. And they even are produced by the attitude of selfishness. Give me another helping. You know what I mean? And we weaken the vital body and then we can't throw off the viruses. I even believe that if you follow Saturn through the signs of the zodiac and through the aspects that it's making, major long-term aspects, you'll find year by year, you know, the viruses are always changing and each year has a different virus. Now Saturn is in Aries, so we'll get away from those goopy types of foods that we've had for the last two years while it's been in Pisces and we'll probably have more febrid types of foods and, uh, you know, like just follow Saturn uh, sign by sign, major aspect by major aspect, and you can see, you know, every symptom, ha every flu has its own symptoms, you know, that you, know, you realize how much uh, we have in common. You start talking to people, they're having these symptoms. They say, yeah, it's exactly the same symptoms I had. And if you start looking at them relative to the zodiac, it really starts making a lot of sense. But at any rate, uh, uh, Oh, boy. How the mineral kingdom 
differentiates from the plant kingdom we've been saying is a matter of change of consciousness from evolutionary experience. Now, this is a very simplified statement of it, but when a mineral is shaped into all kinds of things, like a desk like this, or a wristwatch, or a radio, or a computer, when it has gone through all of those forms, and the whole cosmos goes back to sleep, and everything unifies in the universal spirit, that collective ego, that group spirit of the mineral kingdom, ponders all of these different forms. And when it sinks in deeply enough, well, this is a tremendously slow process. Tremendously slow. It sinks in deeply enough so that what happens is in the next stage of evolution, it gets the idea, I don't have to make these many forms. I can make one form that changes, that grows. And that is the difference between the consciousness of the group spirit of the minerals versus the group spirit of the plants is that the latter has an understanding of the extension of form by being able to incorporate within it a life that allows for growth. So the thing, the big thing that differentiates plants from minerals is life. Everything that lives in the material world Animals and humans, everything that lives, needs its life from the plant kingdom. We can get some from sunlight, but everything that lives has to have vital, etheric stuff from plants. We can't do without it. Nothing, there have been experiments they put, uh, at one time, the German Navy put the best of their seamen in a submarine with no live food, and they had all of the food that was uh, uh, desiccated and dehydrated or synthetic, and they put them out for six months, and quite a few of them didn't even live. They were so malnutrient by the time they came back that they were just, just hulks of themselves. They were no longer viable human beings. We have to have live, fresh life, and that is the service of the plant kingdom. The plant kingdom gives us vitality. It gives us life. In fact, I don't think we can, we can or even should live exclusively on raw, fresh fruits and vegetables, but it should be a large part of our diet because it, we need that vitality. We need that kind of vigor. It's a very potent stuff. We didn't talk about it when we talked about the etheric planes, but the, the way the life ether works is as what it works together with water and it gives the uh, water a uh, strength which, which botanists call turgor. T-U-R-G-O-R. And Max Heindel claims that the etheric energy uh, of the vital ethers, the, the life ethers, not the higher ethers, but the life ether working through sprouting plants, he claims that uh, in Atlantis, that's the way they used to launch uh, vehicles up into the air. That's, that's quite a statement. But I've seen evidence of it. Uh, many years ago, there was a magazine that had a photographic essay. Uh, they showed this this photographer was walking across a parking lot and it was six inches thick of asphalt and he noticed a crack. He took a photograph of it and each day he took photographs of it and the crack ramified and it split it and started li lifting off until the uh, six inches of asphalt was pushed aside and out came a mushroom. And that mushroom was just as soft and puffy you know, you could break it and crumble it like any other mushroom, but the etheric energy together with the water, the turgor in that was enormous power. It, you know, there are roots of trees, split rocks. The powerful, powerful force. This is the kind of energy, subtle though it may seem, that 
is given to us by plants. In fact, because plants are only two steps removed from us rather than three steps removed from us, they are the ideal food. Minerals, the only value that minerals have in the body taken in as chemical minerals are to provide electrolytes. If we can get those electrolytes from another source, we're much better off than taking in the minerals. Max Heindel mentions in the Rosicrucian teaching that basically stony minerals are all minerals and in the, in, in the pure inorganic state are poisons to the body. And the body does everything it can to eliminate them. We do need the electrolytes, and I wouldn't recommend uh, going on an all-plant diet unless you're going to get unless you're going to have something for for the source of all the electrolytes. But the plants, that is what the plants are meant to do. That's their service: is to take the mineral kingdom and give it to us and, and give life to us through those forms. Now, what happens is. When a mineral becomes a plant, it sacrifices. It sacrifices the ability to give form. Not completely, because there are some forms that, uh, you know, the, the life in the plant kingdom makes improvements. You know, that, so we have all of the organic chemicals that come from plant kingdom, which are, which are really uh, quite an improvement. And we have wood. Wood is uh, a form that has been improved on and it's from being just a pure mineral like the plaster in the walls or like the steel in the girders. Uh, there, there are improvements, but the, the way it is, you always sacrifice and you let somebody else have a chance so that when you rise to the level so that you give life to the cosmos, then you sacrifice the ability to pure form. All right. We're going along nice and slowly, and it's also going along nice and fast. All right. Almost all of the ethers in the vegetable kingdom, almost all the etheric work is done in the chemical and life ether. There is some at the negative pole of the light ether, that is the coloration of uh, of uh, chlorophyll and the coloration of flowers, but actually the work that is most done by the plant kingdom, what they share is the vital life, because they don't have organs of perception. And so why would they need the uh, perceptual or the more spiritual ethers than the, uh, the ones that are, uh, uh, that, that are more associated with higher faculties? All right. The Rosicrucian philosophy also has an unusual uh, statement here, and it says that uh, that the collective spirit, the group spirit of the plant kingdom, has become closer to its bodies. That is to say. In the mineral kingdom, as we see the minerals around us, the consciousness is still all in the universal spirit. By the time our plants have become plants, they have raised up into the ethers and they give vitality and life to us. And spiritually, they have been differentiated now as an entity, a group self or a group ego, that is focused in the world of thought. As a consequence of this, it's like if we go to sleep and we get beyond our dreams, because our dreams are in the desire world where all the pictures and colors are, if we go beyond that to the world of thought, we're so knocked out we're in a dreamless sleep. And the Rosicrucian philosophers find by their seership and their association of consciousness with the plant kingdom they find that the consciousness of a plant is like what we are in a dreamless sleep. We're not completely driven out as in a trance, but more like when we're in that dreamless sleep. It's an interesting conception. Um, 
Another thing, now that things get a little bit more intricate, and that is that because there is the whole desire world between the group spirit and the vital body of the plant, between that, there's the whole desire world, the, everything works from without. And if you're working from without, that is very awkward. So the Rosicrucian philosophy has the conception, and they show that there are specialists in the etheric realms who were human-like. When they were human-like, their densest vehicles were ethers, so that their vital bodies, their expertise at building vital bodies, when they became self-conscious, made them specialists in it. And so what happened, these beings are what we know as angels. At least that's what they're called in the Rosicrucian philosophy. They're one step ahead of us in the same way we are one step behind the, uh, this, this is a wonderful coevolution. And with their expertise, since the group spirit is still in a dreamless sleep, it's wise but sleepy, the help with the work with the etheric vehicle is done by the angels. Like over each of these trees is an angelic being. And it helps the form side of the plant kingdom to grow. So there, it's a very cooperative, interactive type of consciousness. So at night when the sun sets and we smell the fragrances that these trees leave off, that's a matter that after the collective, uh, that, that the external uh, consciousness working through the ethers has relaxed, then what happens is since the, since the plants aren't uh, self-conscious, what happens is that released in the ethers with the smells, you know, remember, you know how smells work. When you, if you smell something, it'll recall for you pictures that go way back to your childhood. You'll smell certain things. And that is because the sense of smell is very closely interwound with the etheric consciousness. And in the essential oils of plants, that is the etheric gift, you might say, of the essence of the experience of the plant that it gives to the cosmos. So what happens, this is why a lot of animals are nocturnal feeders, because they, uh, they come out at night because they do things by smell, and they eat where they, where they can smell things. The angels retrospect for the plants. Whatever's happened to that tree or whatever's happened to that plant, as well as guiding the whole life of the, of the tree or the plant, the angels are doing the retrospective. Nothing is lost. Not even the experience of a plant is lost. A whole countryside, everything that happens on the, in the countryside, nothing is lost. Those pictures aren't just because a plant isn't self-conscious or just because an animal isn't self-conscious. That doesn't mean that all of that experience that it's gone through should be wasted just for the mere experience itself. It has to be saved somewhere. And so the retrospection is done then by the helping spirits, the angels that uh, do the uh, do a lot of the guidance work. Uh, there isn't really an official term given for the uh, tutelary or guidance work of the angels that for the plants. The sense, the uh, space doesn't uh, make any difference the group spirit of the plants can work from anywhere in space. But we noted uh, uh, two days ago when we talked about the etheric worlds, we noted that plants were always planted, that is, rooted into the earth. And so what the Rosicrucian philosophy claims is that that consciousness in the world of thought, that is the collective group spirit, the group ego of the plant kingdom, works from the center of the earth and it radiates out. And therefore the plant grows with its intelligence toward the group spirit. This is what in uh, botany is called a geotropism. There's a hydrotropism that a plant will grow toward water and there's a geotropism 
that every plant, given the chance, if there's not a rock in the way or something like that, will grow toward the center of the earth. This, the very curious ideas, this means that the plant is the inverse of the human. We have our heads up toward the sun. The root is the head of the plant, and it's pointing toward the root spirit. The plants take in carbon dioxide and throw off oxygen. We take in oxygen and throw off carbon dioxide. There's a, it's worthy of a whole talk itself, the way the plants are the inverse of a human being, that their place in evolution is just opposite of ours. One little thought that I find very inspiring is that the tutelary spirits, the guiding spirits, the angels, their consciousness is what keeps the plant alive as long as it is alive. That means some angel, like if you take a bristle cone uh, pine, has been there for hundreds of years. Now, is that a span of attention? But some of them, if you think about it, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to something really important. If you think about it, some plants, this means that some angels must be very young in their development, like us. Some plants live microbially only a few minutes. And that means that the ability of that angel to hold its attention of being able to hold life for that microbe is only that long. Well, isn't that a wonderful motivation for us in our concentrations? Because someday something is only going to live as long as we can hold our attention. That's, that's a real motivation. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And if we are going to do that, our attention is going to be the life someday. Because we're the helpers for the mineral kingdom. You know, we're making the things out of them now. In a way, this is already true. Because to some extent, lives of our friends, even as humans, depend on how well we can fix our concentration when we're doing healing prayers. As long and as deep as we can pray, somebody's life may depend on that. It's true that for the most part, we aren't good prayers yet, or I don't think I'm a good prayer yet, but we can bring down something from the Christ level to the etheric plane that can be used and no matter how little, it might be enough to just turn the corner. Sometimes just touching a patient is enough for them to get through a crisis. And really it isn't. It we're not much different than an angel holding a microbe alive for a few seconds. It's, it's a really important stuff. Okay. When it comes to the animal kingdom, uh, material science is very discerning. Material science says that the whole animal kingdom goes all the way from the single cell level all the way up to, uh, they claim, the humans. <laughs> the uh, material scientists uh, refuse to differentiate between animals and humans. Uh, it says quite a bit right there. I don't think I need to say anything more. Um, and this is a really, this brings up a really important evolutionary Rosicrucian principle. Uh, Max Heindel liked to use a lot of those old saws, and he said, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. And we get treated in our evolution, even as creatures, we get put through all kinds of forms we get all kinds of plant-like states. There are recapitulation after recapitulation, and we always see something from a new point of view because the spirit is universal. It isn't just quickly you go through and you learn, you learn a few lessons and you're all done. 
the Spirit is so universal in the amount of proof that is in it that for us to wake up to all of that, we have to have all of these different kinds of experiences. And the beautiful part is, is that within them, we do get to evolve. We do get to try creative things, even if we make monstrosities. So it's a very recapitulatory process. And in this recapitulatory process, when you learn something new, like the difference between a plant and the difference between an animal, you don't add a new faculty like you add an addition onto a house. You don't take and add something on the outside. It has to come from within. So every time you go right back to the beginning and you come out altogether new, only you are now anticipating the fact that you're going to be able to have desire now instead of just merely life. And so when we look at the evolutionary chain, uh, going all the way back to uh, things like amoebas, uh, I'm, I'm going to be taking a course this fall this in uh, uh, physiology in the break room. I, I work for the physics department, but we share a building with the, uh, with the pharmacist. And I've, I've developed a great friendship with this uh, pharmacy professor who teaches physiology. And every day I climb in on something. I have a question, or every week I have a question of the week. And he always gives me an explanation. And I'm, I think he's going to let me sit in on this course. And he relates the, uh, the uh, physiology of the amoeba to the physiology of the human. You want a little side trip? Yes. It's, it's, it's a <laughs> this is something I picked up from him, although it's not in his words. Do you know that the neuromuscular reactions in our bodies are based on symbolic logic, just as you would expect from, from a Gemini nervous system. So that if you do a uh, you think you know, where you hit the, and get the response, there is a trigger that the nervous impulse goes from the knee, it goes back up to the brain, and the brain says, oh, kick the leg out. It goes out, it, it sends everything back and it says, kick the leg out. But that's only one half, that's only one of the twins. It's, the other one is uh, uh, an opposite neural uh, impulse goes down the back side of the leg and it says, don't inhibit kicking the leg out. So it is a logic of A and not, not A. Every movement that we make in our body, when we're walking down the street, every time we're doing that, that's being repeated millions of times over and it's based on the, the yes, do this, and the no, don't stop this. And that's perfect Gemini kind of logic, and it's really beautiful. And the man is a genius to me because he keeps saying, I have all these wacky ideas. I, I, I love physiology, and I always want to study more and more of it, and, but I never get a chance to, and I never have the time to. In fact, maybe when I retire, I might try to do that. But uh, uh, that is, uh, that, you know, that's, that's a side trip. All right, at any rate, when we build in a new feature, we start all, all over again. It's getting to that time of the day that we're having to cut again. Oh uh, boy. Here I thought today I was going to get everything said. I think I'll never have a talk in my life where I get everything said. Uh, the new development, as we have seen before or earlier, is motivation. Here, following along the lines of the Rosicrucian philosophy, after a plant-like existence, the plant group spirit returns back to the chaos of the universal spirit when nothing is differentiated and there is the great sleep and it mulls over things. And mind you, this sounds really simplistic, but in the same way that it said, I've been through all of these forms and now I have learned that I can take a form and have it grow, and so I don't have to go through a whole bunch of separate forms. I can have one form that keeps changing. After this sleep, it says, hmm, I can detach this form, and I can move it around. I can have a life that is more elaborate. 
Can you imagine? This takes millions of years for something like this to dawn on us. And when you think about it, just within our short life, we have been presented so much in the Rosicrucian philosophy for us to come into waking consciousness of it in a few years. It's amazing that we have such a gift and that if we can be open to it and really work on it, that it can really come to full waking consciousness in ourselves. But that's the kind of thing that happens. And what it comes out with is motivation. Not only the ability to move around, but the desire to move around. Now, here the Rosicrucian philosophy isn't really explicit about it, uh, but it's there if you have to dig. Animals have desires, but for the most part, the desires are simple and they're crude. Feed me, let me reproduce, basically those things. But the desire body of the animal each species of an animal is more than just simple, crude desires. Each species of an animal and its, and its desire body represents a very complex desire structure. That is, it represents something like a temperament. So that if we look at the habits, the smells, uh, the foods that a species likes, they are telling us something that each, each species that exists, exists as a desire complex, and it gives the whole idea of that complex to the world as its gift. Astrologers would be much better off going for nature walks than reading the same tired old books over again and again. If they went out and studied animals, and studied animals in such a way that they could see that these habits point to characteristics so that the string of animal species is sort of like a gigantic musical scale. And each temperament of each animal gives a value to the world. The Greeks used to do this in the ornithology. They had a bird book, and from the habits of birds, they extrapolated or they transcended to the lofty ideas. Uh, looking at the signs of the, looking at you know, looking at the habits of pigs, you get something about the nature of Taurus. Or looking at the habits of cows, you get something about the nature of Taurus. Each a little different side, and. Those are things, those ideas that are behind those uh, personalities, or I don't know what's the right word, temperaments. Each animal temperament are something that can be expanded all the way to a large scale astrological level. The Native Americans still have this in part of their religion. They realize that to experience, they even realize that some of our lives, in the same way we say, we say we have a planetary ruler, they say they have an animal ruler for their life. And they come to the understanding, maybe not quite as universal as, as having a, a, a planetary ruler, but they come to the understanding of the nature of the animals. This is, so what we're saying is that the value or that the service that the animals give are to give desires, entire temperaments to the world. Chief Seattle, when he made his famous speech, had it absolutely right. He said, woe be unto us when the white men have cut down all of the forests and have killed all of the animals. When the animals are gone, and you know, if there are no whales or no birds to sing into the physical world, the stuff that is necessary, the world is in a tough shape. Now, it is true that there are evolutionary changes. Like those temperaments that used to be the dinosaurs, we don't need those anymore. We've outgrown that, or the cosmos has outgrown that. If we think about deer or horses, there weren't very many of them. They were little teeny tiny things when the dinosaurs were around. They have become big, and they have become prolific. But we have to have animals in the world. 
It's really a shame when all those beautiful, happy-faced manatees, hundreds of manatees died this year because of pollution poisoning. You know, and the way we deal with animals now, we, we, we treat them as they only belong to us for our pleasure. We have cows with great big udders that they drag on the ground and they have to wear braziers and then they break down the spines of the cows because of the weight of the, uh, of the udders, all because we want to get more milk and you know the bovine growth hormone that they inject them with, they get illness after illness after illness. The cows are, are, are sick all the time, it's, you know, there's something radically wrong. What we're saying is each animal species has a reason to live. Each animal species has something to offer us, and we just can't willy-nilly uh, go uh, jerking them around or wiping them out uh, for our own sake. You know, there, there is a purpose and an end to the animal kingdom in itself. Human desire bodies, we have a temperament that is a microcosm of the whole universe. We're not a special temperament. You know, we, we each have uh, our, our, our specialties within a few lives or something like that. But uh, each animal has a special kind of uh, specialization. Now, the interesting thing is, where are we here? I'm lost in my notes again. <laughs> Let's just skip a bunch. The uh, group spirit of the animal kingdom is one step closer from the inner spiritual worlds. Is uh, You see, we have to look at things differently. When we looked at the material science point of view, material science had a bottom-up point of view, as if saying something dumb could make something smarter than itself. And you just can't do that. Max Heindel says it in a different way. He says, you can't make a body more sensitive than you are. If you aren't that sensitive, you can't make a body that sensitive. You can't make a body any more sensitive than you're capable of living out. So this is very clear that the spiritual philosophy is different from the material philosophy in that the spiritual philosophy is a top-down. We began in spirit first, even though we immersed ourselves in unconsciousness in matter. And it's top-down, not a trickle-down. Top-down because it actually gets there to the bottom. <laughs> the trickle-down doesn't seem to have made it. We made a lot of millionaires and we made a lot more poor people, but nothing happened beyond that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the Rosicrucian philosophy is not only a top-down philosophy, but a bottom-up philosophy at the same time. That is to say, each stage of the evolution, the body becomes softer, it becomes more complica uh, complicated and more ramified and more sensitive, and at each stage, the spirit gets closer. Now, as things stand right now, there's a very curious phenomenon with regard to the animals. The animals have a desire body, and they function in the desire world. The group spirit of the animals, or the collective ego, as uh, the cosmic conception calls it, has come down one step from the world of concrete thought, and it's in the desire world. And the tutelary beings that guide the animals through all of their lessons, the archangels, are also in the desire world. They're all three in the, in the desire world, but because there is not a link of self-conscious mind, the group spirit and the, uh, and the body are uh, close, but not concentric, so, there, so that the consciousness is not internal. It's the only case in the entire of our solar evolution that the group spirit and the highest vehicle are in the same realm without having waking self-consciousness. It's a peculiarity that we are right in the middle of our evolution. And that is, there are, you know, like we began at the beginning of the evolution and we reached our height of material consciousness 
when the world was the most dense and we will be the most rare in our spiritual consciousness. So we as human beings are, as Paul says, a very special first fruits, that we are very special. And this time is very special too because at no other time, whether the Saturn, Sun, Jupiter, Venus periods, at no other time will it be that the group spirit and the highest vehicle are in the same world at the same time. This means that our animals are the most animated animal like because they're all right there at the same at the same thing. There are all kinds of curious things in the, in the Rosicrucian philosophy. The uh, group spirit, because it is focused in the desire world, sees things as pictures. Now even though the animals have to give up the ability to create life and that you know, they quit growing after a while. In order to be able to experience desire, you have to you have to forego the ability to keep on growing. And so there is a growth limit between every animal that there isn't in the plant. The plant will grow on and on and on. Uh, but in the in that sacrifice of life, it hasn't been so complete that the, the animal still doesn't. Uh, produce some life. I've lost my track on my thoughts here. I'm away from the notes, and I'm really in a sad place now. Uh, a difficult uh, situation. No, it's all right. We're, we're going to be about five, five or ten minutes over. That's all. Um, We were talking about the consciousness of the animals because they uh, they don't produce life anymore, but they, in the same way that the plants improved on the forms of the mineral kingdom by producing organic compounds, the animals improve on the life of the plant kingdom by being able to use more of the ethers. Animals can use both poles of the light ether and the negative pole of the reflecting ether. It's clear that they have memory. And this means then that the higher animals are going to have the consciousness of the desire world in pictures, which we call animation. And they're going to be technicolor because they have had the experience of color through the uh, positive pole of the light ether. Uh, despite all of that, I, I'm not a big fan of animation. For human beings, I don't believe that we should uh, uh, do animation in cartoons as we do. In the first place, they're flat, and we need to see more dimensionality. We're already ruining our eyes by reading too much on flat papers or flat screens and not seeing things with depth. And we even, even our faces have changed. If you see a sailor who looks off at the horizon all the time, there's a much different look in the eyes. That's why you're different, Ross. We know that. You're looking, you're, you're, you're looking off at the horizon. Oh, you do. Yeah. No, but yet, when we live more, did, did that click off? I guess it did. Extremely, uh, it's an extremely sensitive recorder. It's worth about $100 a pound. Uh, it's good quality, but uh, pay for it. Uh, we were talking about the consciousness of the animal kingdom and how they cooperate and co-evolve by giving feeling. Uh, each of the animals just like each of the minerals, and in a way, each of the plants represents the entire image of evolution as we go through the different phyla. There is a chart, for example, in the Rosicrucian philosophy uh, that uh, helps us to understand the, uh, our past evolution by watching or looking at animal farms. By doing that, we see the uh, various temperaments as they develop. It's a wonderful thing to be able to just, for example, follow the uh, whole idea of creativity. Like some of the animals first just split in half, and that's how they procreate. Some of them 
procreation is completely external. The eggs and the uh, uh, sperm are given externally, as in fishes. Some, you know, and gradually it becomes more and more internalized, so that with human beings, everything, the whole gestative process is internal. So what we're trying to say that in each of the stages of the animal evolution, it relates to things in our own spiritual evolution and unfoldment of consciousness. For example, the uh, uh, Rosicrucian philosophy teaches that any animal that has a liver, which includes the mollusks, feels pain. This is the primary reason why we don't uh, eat animals is because it takes so much more for them to develop, to experience as they develop, and they are not intended for food because the vitality that we need we can get from plants, and that's why plants exist, to give us life, but because we cause pain and suffering. So even if you're eating merely shellfish, that shellfish feels pain, anything that has a liver. The uh, feelings within the body are changed at various levels, like when there is a uh, internal spine rather than an external spine. That represents another level of development of consciousness. And when there's warm red blood, there is also another uh, differentiation of consciousness, but that is uh, uh, going uh, way farther than we want to go. I have a number of things here I'm going to just skip on because we're, stated, we're way overstayed. And uh, now we come to those other billions of kingdoms, the human beings. According to the Rosicrucian philosophy, each human being, that is each person who can say, I am, and have a conception of self, is a kingdom. Because with us, the group spirit is gone. The spirit has been individualized. From that animal-like experience, we not only learn motivation and we not only learn separate existence in a physical sense, in the time in between, we awaken the conception of a separate self. And in the past few thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, that self has been drawing into the physical, emotional, etheric bodies, and we have been becoming progressively more self-conscious. So in a way, we are the most disobedient human beings. We're right in the middle. We've got the most slip. At one end, the minerals are the most highly obedient because they are, their consciousness is in the universal spirit and they can't resist. On the other hand, the deeper we go into the realm of the gods and the spiritual hierarchies, the more perfect the consciousness is and the more they wouldn't want to disobey because they are so much in harmony with the truth that everything they do is perfectly obedient to the truth because it lives in them. But we as human beings, physiologically, we are a lot like the animals. But spiritually, we're like the gods. We can create and we can, uh, we can inject new things into destiny. We're going to talk about that a lot next week. So that our spot as human beings, each one of us is a different kingdom. Like when you take animals, within a given species of animals, uh, that same species all have the same taste in food. They all have the same habits. They all migrate together. It's really amazing. Like uh, there are things that are so beautiful. You can just see the, if you ever watch a school of fish or if you ever watch a flight of birds, you're seeing the way the, the uh, archangel spreads its desire body through that flight of birds or through that uh, school of fish. And you can try it, and I've tried it again and again. If you see a bunch of little fish all sorted together in the water and you just make a noise like that to frighten them, they'll go all different directions, but they'll never bump into each other. Never. Because they're all part of the same spirit. The same thing with birds. 
You know, every now and then you'll find a whole bunch of sparrows together in a bunch, and you walk up and frighten them. And if it were just probability, the way the, uh, uh, the, 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 the way material science says, they bump into each other. Never happens. Never happens because there is that kind of intelligence. But when it comes to human beings, we are so different that we all have different tastes in food. But it goes even different than that. You can take powerful drugs that will overcome the body consciousness in one person, but the next person will take it and it will have a totally different effect. And a drug is much more overpowering in its influence on the consciousness and on the function of the physical, uh, you know, the physical etheric body. And so you, you can see very clearly that each human being is a different species. We are, we have the uh, self-conscious spirit within our compound bodies. So let's sum it all up as far as a human being. We are awake in all of our bodies. We have a physical body, an etheric body, a desire body, and a mind, and the spirit is awake in all of them. We have the full range of the physical body. We utilize all the poles of all four ethers of the etheric body. We have the potential of all of the emotions of the emotional body, but we're just beginning with the mind. We can only operate on the uh, uh, continental region of the mind, as we talked about yesterday. Now, we have to talk about that all-important thing, service. The mineral kingdom, by its resistance, gives us form. The plant kingdom, as its service and its value to the universe, gives us life. The animal kingdom gives to us emotion, feeling. It gives us the temperaments of the different species. We, as human beings, give thought. That is our service to the cosmos, is to think. The more creatively we think, the more we are serving the cosmos. Think however we want to think, but think. We are the only beings right now that are self-conscious in the external, exclusively external world, and we are the only beings that can, through our thoughts, report that to God. We are the only beings that can self-consciously bring thought into the external world. In fact, we are the only ones that will ever be able to. This is our duty, is to think. We can think like poets. It doesn't have to be like anything written in a book. We can think like scientists. We can think like laborers. But it is our duty to think. So whether we want to look at a sunset or whether we want to think about somebody's psychology or whatever, it is our duty to think, think, think. In fact, if we could get into uh, spiritual exercises by the Rosicrucian philosophy, we would find that all of our spiritual awakening comes about as a process of using the threefold spirit to think. So that Descartes had it right when he said, I think, therefore I am, therefore I think I am. So, do only the fit survive? No. The fit do survive, but the cooperators the co-evolvers are the ones that not only survive, but they evolve. We all survive, but it isn't mere survival we want. We want creation. We want full participation. God doesn't want us just surviving here. God wants us giving, and everything serves. We're all kingdoms, each of us, and each of us is co-evolving and therefore, for us, 
it is a self. We don't have a, we don't have our archangels or angels moving us about. We do collide with each other every now and then, but the cooperation is up to us. We work together, we do it voluntarily, and we do it self-consciously. So let's all work together now and say the Rosicrucian prayer. O oh God, increase our love for Thee, so that we may serve Thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in Thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Well, next week we get into a totally different kinds of things. We start really getting down to some useful things in this. <laughs> What? No questions? The duty of the angels is, well, one of the duties of the angels is to help the uh, group spirit of the plants by helping the plants to form life and to bring that experience of life into the uh, cosmos wherever. And they do that by working through water. Uh, wherever there is water, there is life. And sometimes uh, they do it really quite collectively. If you go to a place where there is no vegetation and you put a tree there and start watering it, that actually attracts the water. You change the rainfall of a place by actually, because once you put a, a tree down, there, this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is known by uh, you know, agriculturists and uh, botanists and such like that. Their, their claim is, is that... Uh, you take a, a region that's dry, not something that where the mountains, you know, that it has to be a desert, but it's dry and there has never been much growing there before. You put a plant down, you start watering it, and an angel starts taking care of it, and it says, hey, bring me in the real thing. Bring me the distilled water that's been up in heaven. And uh, before you know it, you, uh, by uh, planting trees, you actually uh, bring water in. In fact, uh, it's, it's even... Uh, uh, more than that, if you watch uh, weather patterns, uh, uh, like uh, cold fronts, for example, slide right along the edge of the coniferous forests. And uh, I think that's due to the kind of life that is there, that even the air itself is to some extent ruled by the beings that are supporting the life that that air is passing through. It, it really is a coevolutionary uh, system that we live in. You had a more specific uh, uh, question there. Uh, okay, and as humans, uh, we're partly responsible for working with the mineral community. Yes. It also says we have a duty to think. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering what the angels and the animals have a duty to do. What, what the angels do is that they flow with wisdom. They don't form, they don't have the separative kind of thinking that we have. See, our mind has been awakened at the time that we have been farthest from the divine and that we are most engrossed in the matter and that has produced a very mineral-like mind, more so than, than normally the, the waking of a mind and we have very separative thinking and thinking is a separative process whereas life is supportive. Even the life of animals, they'll, they'll cross species and they'll take care of babies but in plants, life supports life. And, uh, you know, you can, like, for example, you can take uh, the watery plants that are ruled by the moon, like the willow family. You can take the, uh, uh, you can take willow branches and cut them up. And uh, the scientists would say it's because of the oxen in them, because for them it's always going to be a stuff. But the water, the, the ether that's dissolved in the water from taking willow cuttings, for example, you can take that life and you can put it on any other cutting that you're rooting or even seeds that you're germinating and they'll grow much more because the life carries with, the etheric body from the plant carries with. And the duty of the angels is to flow that life in and to pour that life in. Yeah, it's a great cartoon. I love it.